I'm pretty confident we'll stay at that trajectory. Now, if we if we are able to keep sort of the reforms going, uh, we might even nudge up towards the 10% mark. Uh, so so I I am very optimistic. I I remain sort of extremely uh, bullish on India. Hello, namaste, and a very good evening, and welcome to Chitta Media. As the Parliament of India approaches the budget session, um, there are a lot of expectations from the common man. And in a COVID scenario, there are a lot of doubts even being raised as to how the uh, government plans to tackle a lot of the economic challenges that are ahead of us. To answer a lot of these questions, we have the founder and managing director of Navam Capital and also a co-author of A New Idea of India. And those are just two highlights of his career. Rajivji, thank you so much for joining us. Namaste. And uh, it's a pleasure to have you here. It's our first conversation. Namaste, Sharanji. My pleasure to be with you over here today. Rajivji, thank you so much, first of all. Um, can I begin by asking you what are the main highlights or the expectations that uh, people have with this budget and what can we see um, as of tomorrow? Uh, I think, uh, you know, we've all gone through a major sort of health and economic crisis. Uh, there are initial signs coming in now that the economy is on track now. So uh, full year growth for this year will probably be north of 9% in spite of certain restrictions that came in due to the Omicron wave. Uh, so we are getting back on our feet, but obviously it's been a difficult two years. So there are still, I think, in some quarters, doubts about the recovery. My personal view is that uh, we are on our way to recovery. And uh, uh, even if you, if you look at the IMF projections, uh, they are saying that next year too, India will be the fastest growing economy, uh, north of 8% growth, and even the year beyond that. So, so I think uh, we are on our way to recovery. Obviously, you know, if, if there's some other variant that comes up or some other disruption that comes up due to the pandemic, right. we can't say. But I think the crisis has been very well managed by the government in terms of both uh, giving support to the uh, vulnerable sections and right. making sure that uh, those sections uh, get the food, they get enough uh, kind of financial support and are able to make it through the crisis. And on the other side, we've also seen some major structural reforms coming in. Uh, so lots of uh, very important policy changes that will have ramifications for, I think, years and even decades to come. What uh, people are also asking is how sustainable is this projected growth? It's very good that the indicators are very positive. Uh, but then, of course, there are uh, eventualities and uh, challenges such as the COVID uh, scenario that is going on. But beyond that, how sustainable can this be, supposing everything goes well and COVID uh, sort of succumbs down? No, so I think I think this India should uh, comfortably be in a seven to eight percent growth trajectory uh, for the next for a few years and possible future. So I'm I'm pretty confident we'll stay at that trajectory. Now, if we, if we are able to keep sort of the reforms going, uh, we might even nudge up towards the 10% mark. Uh, so so I, I am very optimistic. I, I remain sort of extremely uh, bullish on India. Right. As uh, you know, those who have read my work, those who have followed me on Twitter and so on would know. So, so I think... Uh, and uh, I think another surprising fact came when the government itself projected a very conservative number. And usually it so happens that the government does inflate it a little bit. Um, so that's one of the changes. So you are very positive that this is going to sustain uh, as of now. Yeah, um, so, so the government's projection for next year is is somewhat conservative. Uh, yeah. But but then I think they are being wise by, you know, looking at all the uncertainties that are prevailing around us. So right. They are being wise by giving a conservative number. It is actually lower than what the IMF projects. Yeah. So, so I think it's only wise to sort of uh, do that. Hmm. Uh, and then, then you know, if, if you keep on the reform path and we are able to keep uh, important uh, segments of the economy open. Right. You know, today, actually, we are seeing in certain states there are lockdowns, shutdowns and so on. And there is a disruption that comes into sectors like travel, lodging and so on. Uh, so, so we need to keep 
uh, things open as the pandemic sort of moves into an endemic mode. Uh, we should also remember India has now vaccinated successfully 75% of its eligible population. Right. Uh, we've delivered over 160 crore shots of the vaccine in a little over a year. So, so these are enormous achievements. And uh, there is reason to be confident that, uh, uh, you know, if we, if we manage such a big crisis well, then as things settle down, you know, I think, I think the economy is really getting into its stride. Rajivji, another um, concern that is being projected in the economic survey is that of imported inflation. And these are also caused by events that you uh, cannot foresee in a lot of uh, situations. So in that case, uh, personally, as somebody um, who has been commenting on these issues, what would your advice be, A, and B, how does the government actually plan to take on this? So when we when we see inflation, obviously the biggest uh, line item of worry for India is the oil prices. So obviously India is a very large importer of oil, uh, heavily used in our economy, uh, especially for transportation, yeah. of course. So, so I mean, what can one do about that, right? Like in the short run, at least there's not much one, one can do about it. Uh, oil prices are what they are, you know, no one really knows right. where, they, where they will go. So I think what best we can do is uh, try to transition the economy away from oil and uh, especially for uh, categories such as transportation, try to bring in electrification. So, and, and then obviously uh, that electric power would be domestically generated uh, it would support the renewable industry. So if we have if we have a large segment of uh, two wheelers and maybe even four wheelers getting into uh, electric vehicles, uh, getting into the electric mode, uh, I think I think that will at the margin arrest the import issue to some degree. And and we are working very heavily on that. If you right. if you see the numbers from the two wheeler manufacturers, even the four wheeler companies like Tata Motors and others. So electric vehicle sales have been rocketing in India in the last 12 to 15 months. Right. And uh, uh, alongside that, I don't think many people have actually noticed that our, our uh, renewable energy generation base has now crossed 100 gigawatts. Yeah, yeah. And, and the new target that uh, the Prime Minister has, said is, has, has set is at the COP26 uh, meeting, uh, India committed to taking it to 500 gigawatts by 2050. Right. So in eight years, we are going to go 5x on the renewable generation front. And that these means, numbers that are generally being achieved these days, which, which was a rarity, you know, in terms of projected so numbers. This, this is an enormous scale that we're talking about. I, I don't think actually uh, people can fathom how massive this transformation is. Right. Uh, we, are, we are actually pivoting our entire power sector towards renewables. And, and that will then have the capacity to uh, support sort of uh, uh, personal transportation, the automotive sector, and so on. Yes. So, so uh, this will have major long-term implications. Okay. Or, so, or the oil problem that you know that this oil import issue has been a very long-standing problem. For yeah. The yeah. Both a macro yeah, problem also, as, well as, as well as the effects on uh, right. uh, impact on price inflation. Yeah, it's also very uh, uh, dependent on a lot of geopolitics and how it develops. Uh, you know, what is the future path for Atmanirbhar Bharat? Because many people are not satisfied with the way India has been uh, growing in terms of, uh, you know, domestic manufacturing and things like that. Um, so what's the way forward from here? No, so I think I think uh, Make in India and Atmanirbhar Bharat both sort of, uh, I guess, like, for the first few years, they were still getting on their feet, but now we are seeing a real momentum build up. So again, if you look at India's share of uh, global merchandise exports, uh, that has crossed 1.9%, the share of global mer merchandise exports that India has. So that's at an all time high now. Uh, okay. And that high has been just achieved very recently. And the categories within that share, that uh, segment, areas like electronics, where India never really was a contributor, right? So uh, I think somewhere the strategy of the government, you know, the combination of uh, moderate tariffs along with doing internal reforms, accepting FDI, uh, and finally uh, the production linked incentives that have been rolled out. Yes. The PLI schemes that have been rolled out in the last uh, 15, 18 months now. 
so all these put together are creating the conditions for indian manufacturing to really get back on its feet right. uh, and 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 clearly there is a certain competitiveness uh, that is now compounding for india so there is light at the end of the tunnel is what you're going to say uh, you yeah, know and, and actually the numbers already bear that out right uh, so 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 you know an all time high in manufacturing uh, merchandise export share uh so you know this figure of 1.9% share will probably increase in the coming years and obviously it has all kinds of knock on effects with jobs being created in india then then you know we we start with the assembly of let's say electronic items like phones and other things so it started with low value sort of uh, work but then right. once you kind of achieve that then you can go further down the, uh, further up the value chain you will kind of expand your ambit yeah and uh, Uh, slowly but surely you keep building your capabilities as a industry as a country and then and then you know 5 8 years later somebody will be like wait what happened i mean india has become one of the largest electronics exporters in the world yeah yeah and even the expectations from the people are slowly maturing and transitioning into uh, bigger and bigger things and i think that's a sign of progress uh, although the government is now forced to you know uh, aim bigger Uh, for that matter you did touch upon the pli scheme uh, now this is something that is um, considered as an underdog of this particular session um, how important is this uh, for the growth no i think i think it has been a very well designed scheme in terms of giving the right incentives to manufacturers both domestic and foreign by the way so it's yeah. not just for indian companies even foreign companies are participating in it. and the incentives are the more you make the more uh, sort of uh, essentially uh, benefit you get from the government so right. the incentives are towards scale and the incentives are open to essentially everybody so whether you're a foreign company or an indian company you can you can come here you know make in india set up your factory here and apply for the schemes obviously fulfilling the conditions of every pli scheme those who are uh, uh, granted uh, sort of uh, that benefit will then have to hit those targets to get that uh, benefit right so, so i think it has aligned the incentives very well for manufacturers and uh, we are still in early stages actually so you know a lot of people might think maybe this is the end of the story but i think this is actually the beginning of the story this is extremely interesting because you know even we as kids when we used to have economic classes we were we, we were taught about populism and welfare schemes and what not so we were still in the socialistic mode not that we are not any more right now but i think uh, it's uh, it's toned down a little bit uh, but uh, in terms of uh, you know subjects like uh, disinvestment and for that matter fdi was considered a taboo almost now the government has disinvested something that has been in the pipeline for a very long time in fact uh, almost 20 years if i'm not wrong <coughs> um now we all know how the uh, how how the tatas used to manage air india before it became air india yes and it was a very good model um now do you think it's too late for a reversal or do you see some hope uh, in terms of how air india can turn around no so uh, firstly i think that was a, a really excellent uh, policy decision to privatize air india a uh, long overdue as you all know uh, you know just to give you a sense of the scale of the capital consumed or incinerated rather completely you know used up by air india uh, 1.1 lakh crores uh, over the last 12 years is what was taken up by air india now imagine what all can be done with that much money so the government whether yeah. it wants to uh, use that for welfare whether it wants to invest in infrastructure there are so many other better uses of that money right or uh, you can spend that on defense i mean so money gone into air india could have been used for so many other projects uh, so firstly that's our excellent decision to privatize air india it was long overdue really necessary uh, and uh, when it comes to privatization in general i think the role of government understanding the role of government is very important so uh, government should not be in the business of running businesses yeah. so government has very specific roles in terms of let's say taking care of those who are underprivileged those who are less well off the vulnerable sections of society government has a responsibility for national defense government has a responsibility for regulation right. regulation of industries and markets to make sure that you know there is a competitive environment 
and there is no uh, cronyism or no kind of uh, capture of uh, uh, certain segments and creation of monopolies right. government has a responsibility for foreign affairs for diplomacy so so these and a few other functions are really the core role the, the task of a government and the rest whatever the private sector can do the private sector should be allowed to do so so finally we are in the uh, zone now where you know we are restructuring india in a right. sense we are going back towards the proper role of government we are leaving those jobs that can be done, done by the private sector to the private sector and of course you know when the private sector does them well uh, the government gets taxes the government gets its share of uh, you know monies from yeah. the value created so so it is in everyone's interest actually right that so the compass is being reset and it's moving north is what you're trying to say um and uh, you know in terms of the sectors now you 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 also touched upon this um, in terms of how the government should look at different sectors and empower institutions and different categories of our economy so uh, there are emerging sectors i i, I think which are not being uh, highlighted in the media so what are some of these areas that we need to look up to in the near future you know without having a particular timeline in mind so so uh, if we focus on the series of defense sector reforms that have unfolded in the last 3 uh, years in particular uh, you know even before the uh, military face off in galwan with china india had embarked upon a series of important reforms starting in 2019 and then in the last 3 years if you if you see cumulatively i think we have covered a lot of ground so uh, there was the k9 uh, k9 vajra tank recently the contract was given to private sector uh, you know so what we are seeing is really again a private sector procurement for defense and this will help create a defense production industry in the country and there are all kinds of downstream effects of having defense production capabilities so earlier what we were doing was we were essentially importing all our weapons or uh, there were certain uh, designated psus who were only manufacturing uh, defense products and and in some cases they are not even companies right they were the ofbs the ordnance ordnance factory boards right which were recently corporatized so so it was a very uh, inefficient system uh, and we had very large imports of weapons so what we are now doing is uh, india is getting into production uh, in that area where it, earlier it was not even happening so i think this this particular industry we will see it growing very rapidly uh, in the years to come and uh, uh, it can really reach a very large scale which i don't think most people uh, are able to grasp at the moment right and besides defense i think uh, obviously like sectors like the tech sector have got a lot of prominence but even within the tech sector uh, there are certain areas there are certain niches uh, which were let's say not uh, not not like uh, very large uh, maybe 5 years ago but uh, nowadays we are seeing entrepreneurs turning to those areas because of the availability of risk capital right so 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 certain kinds of frontier tech companies deep technology companies they are sort of uh, building uh, in india earlier the logic would be ki if you want to do this you know this doesn't happen here you should go to california or you should do it somewhere else you know do it somewhere abroad but now we are seeing entrepreneurs take up these companies uh, take up these kind of uh, ambitious ventures uh, and and they are getting funding from the private equity venture capital funds there are large swath of angel investors also now in the country yes. because of all the wealth creation that has happened in the last 3 years so so we are seeing i think in both these categories enormous sort of potential that the country has and we will see some of that being realized right thank you so much uh, it's been an enlightening conversation and um, um again it's a pleasure to have you here on our platform and i hope you can join us again uh, for such conversations thank you sharan happy to be here with you thank you so much have a good day ahead please remember to subscribe to us and switch on the notifications for this channel for our other social media links more content and to support our work please visit citti.net dhanyawad namaskar